And we're live. What we're going to do first is I'm going to go over here through the Facebook and I'm actually going to get this shared out just a little bit. Um, for those who are listening and for those who are listening just to the audio version, let me be the first to say um, hello. Let me be the first to say uh, we're in for a really interesting episode today. We're going to do what I'm going to call UTV 101. And what UTV uh, 101 means is I'm going to cover everything you need to know to either buy a UTV, what you need to have, uh, what you need to look for on a used machine. And then if you buy new, some upgrades, some things to keep in mind, is the warranty worth it? Uh, financing, things like that. We can have a short discussion about all those topics. But primarily, okay, I've got a UTV. Um, what do I need to be successful and what are the upgrades that I need to do now? What are the upgrades that I personally prefer to do right out of the gate? And then on top of that, uh, what are the upgrades that can probably wait that people seem to do? Um, so while we uh, kind of build up here, um, I think if you're a regular listener of the show, um, you'll know that I actually have done a podcast before. Uh, I've done a full episode on which UTV is right for you. Uh, I personally have run a uh, RS1. I have run a XP1000, which is my current machine. I've run an XP Turbo, a XP1000 Razor Buggy, a full rock bouncer. And I've also uh, gotten a chance to run um, a, or been in a Can-Am X3. I've gotten a chance to drive a Turbo S. I've gotten a chance to drive a, a new Pro XP. So I have a really good knowledge, a really wide uh, array of different vehicles and things like that. Now, I will asterisk all this with I've never driven the Kawasaki KRX and um, I'm pretty I, I would like to. Let me just start by saying that um, we're going to kind of hit all the brands. Obviously, I'm a Polaris guy. If you guys listen to the show for any length of time, um, I'm going to probably focus more specifically on the Polaris stuff today. Um, I will talk about the X3. And, uh, and the KRX just a little bit as well. However, um, it'll be a little bit Polaris based, if you will. Uh, first things first, I've sat in a Kawasaki KRX, excellent machines, overbuilt for the power. If the KRX either comes out with a four seat or a turbo option, um, that may be enough for me to you know, sign my name on the dotted line. I'm very interested in that machine. In fact, uh, I'll pull that machine up because on screen, I actually have a uh, Razor XP Pro 2020. Um, so let's see, a KRX 1000, just for everyone. So you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, it's the uh, Kawasaki machine. For those who are not familiar, it is an excellent looking machine. Uh, I, again, have seen one in person. They're excellent um, in terms of design. The axles are huge, the A-arms are huge. The suspension is really, um, let's just say like this, not going to have an issue with tender spring collapsing right off the showroom floor. Um, I'm a big fan of the KRX. Again, never driven one, so it goes, you know, my recommendation can kind of go as far as that right there. Uh, let's talk about Can-Am X3. Um, if you're going to buy a Can-Am X3, and, and I, we're going to get into a kind of a, a Q&A session here at the end of the podcast where I've actually posted something on Facebook, and I got a lot of information from people about what they wish they knew um, going into it, if you know, if they could do it all over again and buy their first machine, um, I would, you know, I, I have asked everyone what their opinions are. Um, a lot of people, a little spoiler here, a lot of people have mentioned that they would go out and buy an X3. Talk about it. Pros, cons. Excuse me, I accidentally muted myself there. Pros and cons of the X3 at a very high level. The X3 is faster. It has more power, and I'm going off the turbo RR. Um, it's an excellent car, lots of suspension travel, really, really great. Um, but the frame automatically needs gussets and stiffeners. If you're someone who's interested in tearing everything apart, if you, well, let me rephrase, if you're someone who's going to run the car extremely hard, uh, you'll have to tear everything off, put stiffeners in right out of the gate. Um, it's really something that needs to be fixed by the Can-Am, um, chassis, Good cars, very fast cars, uh, very, 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 very fast. Uh, for those who haven't listened to a previous podcast before and heard me talk about it, I got to ride in Hubert Rollins from uh, Nitro Circus. 
It's got a, uh, I think the, the Fox tune, it's got a few different suspension upgrades, uh, things like that. Uh, excuse me, the Dynajet tune is on the engine, the Fox tune on the shocks. Uh, Dynajet has unlocked that bad boy to be a monster of a machine. It really feels like the wheels are barely hanging on the ground. Great car to start with. Um, but let's go on to Polaris because that's where my roots go. I would say that Polaris still is dominating uh, the kind of general market. They still probably have the strongest graphs uh, on just the, the regular market. Now, I, I say that with a little bit of a hesitation there, and I stumbled on my words a little bit because k and getting close. Uh, they're getting very, very close. But even when I went to go buy this machine uh, a year and a half, two years ago, um, there was a lot of debate on an X3. And the reason that I chose a, uh, a an XP1000 was if I'm stranded at Winrock or I'm in a situation where I need parts, I know for a fact that they're going to have the Razor XP model or 900, you know, they're going to have parts there for it. It's the most common platform out there. So aftermarket support and in the event that I ever got myself in a tight situation, that's why I went with that machine. Okay. There's the gist of it. Here's the tagline. If I had to do it again, I would buy a turbo for the upgraded transmission, drivetrain, um, differentials. Everything is stronger in a turbo. If you're looking for my quick answer, go buy a Razor XP Turbo. That's the car to buy. Perfect. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the cars. Let's talk about um, you know you go out and uh, you buy. A, we'll pull up the 2020 uh, Razor Turbo here. You go out and you buy this car, um, brand new off the showroom floor. Um, we're going to go through the new route first, and then we're going to hit the used market, uh, what to look for when you're doing used. Um, so first things first, you go buy a car right off the showroom floor. Um, regardless, if you buy a used machine or if you buy a new machine, my first recommendation is always going to be, um, you know, obviously on the test drive, if it's a used machine, go out, run it, make sure everything just runs right, make sure your gut feels right on a used machine, a used purchase. Um, always, if there's engine work done, just take a second look at it. Maybe take someone who's a little bit more handy with engines. Um, I am not an engine guy. I am capable in everything else. I do not know how to replace headers and dig into the internals of engines and things like that. It's not my forte. Um, I have a guy for that. And I also always use my gut. Um, your gut is normally correct. So especially on machines, you know, you can normally tell by the person you're dealing with if you're going to if they're being honest, you know, uh, I know I actually read something today where a gentleman had bought a machine uh, from someone where they had done, you know, top end work. And uh, the guy had actually spun a rod and he would put transmission fluid in there uh, to compensate for the rod spinning. It was just a crazy mess. So um, use your good judgment when it comes to used machines. But the first thing I always say when you do buy a machine is take it out for a break in weekend. Um, take it out for. Uh, kind of a, you know, that, that, uh, what's the word that everyone in off-road uses um, to, to go break in their machine, um, drawing a blank on the word, but uh, that first ride where you're going to go work out the kinks and work out the bugs, um, things to look for on a new machine um, would be shifting, you know, can I put it into gear correctly? Does it ride well? Does it sound right? Does it steer? Um, go out, run it at 70. 75 uh, make sure that it can get there make sure you're not going to have any kind of electrical issue and then once you're done uh spending the day in the rocks you know do a little bit of low do a little bit of high um do a little bit of a little bit of everything and, and get back to your machine and, and the things that i'm going to talk about are, are true for the used machine as well um i'm going to derail for a second if you have a used machine on that break-in ride where you're really trying to get some information on, you know, where's the machine really at now that I'm, I've got some, some, you know, I bought it. I want to make sure it's good before I go, you know, drive four and a half hours to a park or, you know, drive to Moab uh, for, for, for goodness sakes, you would want to know ahead of time. Um, but uh, one thing that I would highly recommend is you go out really hammer on it and low, high, all that kind of fun stuff. But after a ride, the first things you're going to want to check, are uh, are for uh, wheel bearings, axles, uh, obviously just making sure that the engine's running clean and good. Um, those are all things for that break-in ride that I really recommend. Um, but we're going to talk about UTV 101. We're going to start at the baseline of I don't know what I'm looking at. 
And then we're going to go all the way up to someone like myself, where you have a very good knowledge of how the parts work, how the pieces work. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about um, the things you need to be successful and the, the, the basic skills you need to be successful with these machines. So um, you buy a car. We're just going to go for a used example. Uh, in our used example, you're going to get a stock machine, um, which is the, the case that I found myself in. Uh, the guy that I got my machine from, he had uh, installed some speakers and drove it around town and painted it white. So for those who are not familiar, uh, let's see if I can get this right here. My entire machine back there is uh, mostly white. Uh, and that was about the most extensive upgrade uh, that was done to it was the paint. So I bought it because uh, me knowing um, just that the guy drove it around town, got a test drive on it. It seemed good. Everything seemed reliable. He seemed reliable. Um, I basically got a stock machine with some miles on it. Awesome place to start. And that's kind of where we're going to pick up. So the first thing I did was I'm a big proponent of don't fix it until it breaks on a certain, on a, on a few certain things. I don't believe that though. Um, you guys have probably seen all of the horror stories on Facebook. Uh, it's the best place in the world to find those, but there are some that are very valuable. Um, the first thing that I will always preach is uh, the stock cages on a razor. So I'm just going to Google, uh, you know, razor stock cage and, and I'm going to go to images and uh, some of the things that you'll see. I mean, I'll, here you go. Here's the first one is uh, this nice. I think this is a 900. Um, the stock cages on the machines. They're just not designed to do, you know, if, if you're going to get yourself in a situation where you're at Winrock and you're trail riding, um, I always use Winrock as the example because uh, Windrock is not only a huge park where you can find yourself stranded. And, you know, if you were to break something, you're a, quite a bit of distance away from someone else to have help you. Um, but Windrock is one of those where you could just be climbing, you know, G1 or a blue trail or any other regular trail. And, uh, you know, you get a little sideways and you've got a, you've got a long way to go uh, in terms of if you fall. Uh, a lot of times you can roll and you'll just roll kind of on the side. It's like a little sleeper fall. Um, those are that's that's fine for the stock cage. You're normally going to be fine there. But in the event that you, you know, typically the rolls are, you know, you go wheels over end at least once, you know, whether that's coming over the front or the back, uh, more than likely it's kind of a side roll type situation. Um, a lot of these stock cages just are made to uh, fault at a certain point. So from an engineering perspective, uh, the cages are designed to, um, let's see if I can find a, a somewhat stock cage here. Um, there we go. I think this is stock or, yeah, there we, there's a decent picture of a stock cage. Um, so the cage is designed to not only bolt together, but it's designed to save your life. And a lot of times, you know, uh, some of these pictures you'll see on Facebook, they don't do that. They, you know, you'll see a stock cage and it's completely folded in and in the top A pillar that you're seeing on the top right of that picture there is sitting in the driver's lap. Um, that cage is designed to take one single, you know, wheel over wheel, uh, or even even a you know sleeper roll there, it's designed to take that and it's designed in the worst case scenario to bend in a way that will not kill the driver and passenger. So people ask me all the time, what's the first upgrade you need to make? Uh, it is an expensive upgrade, and and maybe you know you can test your luck and get a ride or two out of a, a, a you know stock factory cage, but I highly recommend uh, a, an aftermarket cage. They're really cool. They add a lot of styling, but more than anything. Um, go to a reputable dealer and get yourself a cage and I'll kind of stop harping on that because that's not a lot of fun. The next thing that is included in the Pro XP uh, is harnesses. Uh, the harnesses are included in the Pro XP. Um, you ought to go on Razor Life on Facebook and ask my friend David Uptain uh, about the Razor Pro XP harnesses. Um, he put a video up, actually, uh, I believe it was yesterday, and he had some uh, extremely extremely choice words about the engineer that that not only put those harnesses or designed those harnesses but uh they're retractable and they're they're razors you know version of the harnesses uh these are an excellent option over the you know standard over the shoulder and lap belt um the over shoulder and the lap belt's just not going to keep you in the vehicle 
Uh, my point here is harnesses are the number one thing you should get. Uh, but even the razor ones that are here, they're an excellent option. However, I would highly recommend you go to a PRP, Pro Armor, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, PRP is the, what I actually have in my machine. I've run a variety of different straps all the way from Dragonfire, PRP, Pro Armor, uh, Polaris, everything in between. Uh, my PRP are substantially more comfortable than anything else. I highly recommend those. They're not a sponsor of the show. Uh, and, and I'll go ahead and kind of diagnose that as well because you know I'm going to be dishing out some parts and some recommendations. Um, everything I say today is outside the realm of the sponsorship of the show. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to call it like it is. Uh, so I, you know, should address that up front, but the PRP harnesses are excellent. So the two things that we've addressed on, you know, any given stock machine are um, harnesses and a cage. So in terms of safety equipment, there's only two other things that I really recommend. Uh, I personally will not go riding uh, without a fire extinguisher. I, as someone who has, uh, unfortunately, uh, let's see if I can find the picture here. Um, I have had a close friend of mine his um, razor, his, his entire machine had a tuner on it and it actually ended up uh, catching on fire because what happened was uh, someone's elbow was hitting the programmer for the tuner. Um, there's a, a picture for everybody. Uh, it was an 800 S and so, uh, one of the passengers elbows back in the good old days where the tuner was adjustable on the fly. Uh, it was just dumping too much fuel in there. The fuel line uh, got hot since it had so much extra fuel. It went up like nothing and uh, ended up smoking that entire machine right there. And it actually left my friend and I stranded. Uh, his truck keys were in there. It was a really, really bad time, uh, really bad time. So I'm a big proponent, again, for a fire extinguisher. I think that those are excellent. And in the event that it's not your machine, it could be your buddies. Uh, my friend uh, who sparked this entire conversation, a friend of mine, got a razor this week and I really thought to myself, you know, what would I recommend if I could do it all over again? He bought the machine, not my exact machine, but he bought the same model, same year, same everything, the, my very first machine. I was like, well, thinking about all the things that I could tell him to save him all the troubles that I've been through. I've been through six or seven machines and I've been into razors since I was uh, 20 years old. So that's uh, five years and I've been through seven machines. So Granted, they all have done a little bit of this, something different, but I think I have a good a good way to get you where you want very quickly. Um, so with that being said, a fire extinguisher is very important. Uh, insurance is expensive on these. And I can tell you that my friend that went through this claim, uh, he had Geico, if I believe correctly, and um, they hassled him hard. They said that they saw videos of it on YouTube being put on fire on purpose and uh, everything you can think of. It was a, not a, you know, hassle free claim situation. Ultimately they didn't end up getting paid out uh, for the vehicle. Everything was good, but definitely not something I would want to deal with. Uh, I can tell you that right now. I highly recommend having insurance, but if you can prevent the situation as a whole, it's better. The next thing, um, is window nets. Um, this is kind of one of the weird ones that, that a lot of people don't talk about. Uh, window nets are basically designed uh, sorry, my screens are going a little wild here. Um, window nets are designed for if you're ever in a high speed roll or you're ever in a situation where, um, as you roll your arms, you know, everything wants to go out of the vehicle as you continue to roll. So the window nets actually, you know, create a barrier. So your arm can't be thrown out of the vehicle. I saw this week on Facebook where a lady, you know, recommended window nets. And I believe it's actually on the post that I made today, making recommendations for first time buyers. Um, she, uh, her fiance lost his arm uh, last fall because they were in a roll. His arms went out. Uh, and, and even, you know, I have an individual that I ride with that uh, he's in this full blown buggy and was just going downward on a hill. And he started to kind of slide into a hill. And it was just human, human nature, human reaction to he set his hand out and, and pushed his hand on the tree. And the buggy took a slide that he didn't expect. And it actually ended up crushing his hand against the against the tree and you know the buggy ultimately kept sliding down the hill but uh, he crushed the entire center of his hand and uh it's things like that that happen fast which window nets are always a good thing um window nets are probably the one that i would recommend last in terms of safety uh just because they're you know they're pretty cheap to have but they are inconvenient in terms of getting in and out of the car 
attaching them to the car is a little inconvenient, uh, but you know, it is what it is. But okay, safety wise, that's pretty much all I have to say. Uh, we can go back to, to all the fun stuff and the fun topics uh, and go back to um, these awesome machines that we love to upgrade. Um, now, I'll tell you, I am a, a form over, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm a function over form kind of guy. Uh, I really prefer to get things that are going to be useful rather than flashy. So things we've covered, cage, saves your life. Harnesses, save your life. Window nets, they save your limbs, particularly your arms. Uh, if your legs are flying out of your car, you, I don't know, maybe you need to be rolling down a hill. I'm not real sure. You need something. Also, just wear your seatbelt. That's a great thing to do. It's just wear your seatbelt. Also, for those watching the video version, I'm giving this a try. If anybody has any recommendations on energy drinks, I really uh, I enjoy them. I'm trying to get off bang because uh, they're going to kill me, I think. So rip it. It's got half the, half the caffeine and it's 99 cents. So we'll give it a shot. All right. So moving on to the fun stuff. Everything, everyone that I've talked to, the first thing they say when they get a new machine is two mindsets. The first is either wheels and tires or it's lights and speakers. So one of those is better than the other. My friends over at Infinite Off-Road, they have everything picked up uh, lights and speakers wise. I'll just tell you guys, again, they're a sponsor of the show, um, but this is a, a no BS recommendation. If you're looking to get lights, if you do nighttime riding, it's a great time. If you do rock lights, if you want rock lights uh, to give it a certain aesthetic, it's great. If you ride in the dunes, they sell whips. Um, all that stuff is backed by a 25 year. You fix it, they break it warranty. That also comes with a discount code from the podcast, uh, R-O-C-K-S at checkout. We'll get you 10% off the entire website. But are lights and speakers the first thing that I would recommend? Absolutely not. Uh, they're cool. I don't even, I, I have a $1,500 speaker system that the guy before me put in on my Razor. I don't even use it. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge fan of listening to music while I ride. Um, I'm not really a huge fan of even really listening to music when I'm just hanging out. I like talking. I like driving. Um, I'm not really one for the 530 club. I really like to cover a lot of ground. Uh, if you've listened to my Windrock episode before, you know that we'll do eight hours in one direction and eight hours back. And I can tell you, you don't cover that kind of like you don't cover 500 miles at Windrock in, in a one day by taking breaks all the time. Uh, I'm a really big proponent of riding. Um, music's all right every once in a while, but it's not my thing. Um, that being said, wheels and tires. The other thing that people always want to upgrade first. Uh, I have run just about every tire and I have run uh, a variety of different wheels. When it comes to wheels, uh, I had someone tell me this is the way to choose what you want. So there's a bunch of different brands and there's a bunch of different quality. There's also a bunch of different prices. Um, the question you should ask when it comes to wheels are how do they handle their warranties? Now, I don't have any, I have zero experience with warranty on wheels. Um, I have cracked three. Uh, I have, you know, blown out the rock rings on a bunch of them. I've just never worried about a warranty. In my opinion, I don't personally think that they should warranty that. That's not, that's not me. If someone wants to send me a free wheel, you know, or a warrantied wheel, I think that's great. Um, but I've never gone through the warranty process myself. So what I would recommend, um, All Things UTV is a retailer of wheels. And, and that's actually Dustin is the guy I got the information from. He or any other retailer can tell you, you know, uh, Raceline, for example. Again, I have no experience in these companies. I'm just pulling names out of a hat. Uh, Raceline, for example, you know, if, if you're going to buy wheels, you ask Dustin, hey, Dustin, uh, how does Raceline handle the warranties? Are the warranties easy? Same thing for Method or System 3 or anything like that. Um, again, I don't have a wheel. I don't have a stake in the wheel game. So, uh, you know, warranty seems to be the issue uh, that a lot of people have. I know I've seen I've seen, you know, half dollar size holes in some wheels uh, that, that are out there. Uh, and, and it's kind of just. You know, that seems probably like you would want to warranty that, um, but I don't have experience with that. Other than that, you have looks and you have offset and wheel rings. So when it comes to choosing a wheel, the most important recommendation I can make for a UTV 101 student, a newcomer, is offset. It's something I didn't even pay attention to when I first bought my first set of aftermarket wheels. 
and I really regretted it because it it made my ride. I mean, it made my 900 XP. I put four plus three offset wheels on my 900 XP. Now I'm actually going to find the shock therapy. Uh, let's see here, shock therapy wheel scrub uh, chart or wheel should be wheel offset chart here. Um, shock therapy has done a really great job of making this not complicated. Uh, and I, and I really wish I could find it right out of the gator. I wish I had already pulled it up here. Um, da, 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 da. Well, I thought it was a little, I thought it was a little bit more visual than it is, but either way, um, I will leave this right here. So what happens when it comes to offset, if it's four plus three is essentially you are shifting. If you see this green line in the picture, and the red line. When you have a four plus three, you are adding distance out on the wheel. So what that means is, uh, for example, here's a great example. Here's my RC tire wheels, okay? Um, if you see, see if I can show it here, there is a deeper dish on the outside of the wheel than there is on the inside. This inside hub here is pretty shallow. So the distance from the inner ring to where it actually mounts to the hub is way less than it is vice versa. If you see there, the outer ring is very is a lot further away from where it actually mounts to the hub. Now, this would be an example of a of a very wide offset, a four plus three. Uh, now, this may be you know not exactly, but uh, this is an example of that where the wheel is actually pushing the tire out. Now that gives you width, which some people want. Um, but what it really does is it increases leverage on parts like ball joints. It increases leverage on parts like wheel bearings and your axles and everything. So already there's a knock against four plus three. I'm not a huge proponent of all that stuff, but more than anything, what it does is it creates chatter and, 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 and just, it creates a, really crappy steering experience. What it does is is this graph that uh, shock therapy has here, and I'll include it in, in the link below or whatever, however I'm gonna do this, I'll put it in the comments when I'm done. Um, as you go out further, your steering just, it, I, don't, I don't really know the technical term to be honest with you. I'd have to re go back and read this article, it's in the article, but it just goes to crap. So the further out that wheel is, your steering goes to crap and it's more damage on the parts. Sounds like a bad idea all the way around. Now, on the flip side, there is four plus three, there is five plus two, and there's six plus one. So as you move from four plus three to a six plus one wheel, it progressively makes this distance from the outer ring to where the hub meets, it makes it shorter, and it puts more distance from the inner side of the wheel to the hub. So what does that mean? Essentially, if this is where my a four plus three sits right here on my vehicle. It's going to move the wheel into my vehicle, making my stance more narrow. But what it's actually doing is it's actually putting the load of the new bigger and heavier tire back into the suspension. It's going to put less pressure on all of your wear parts, wheel bearings, ball joints, things like that. Uh, and it will keep, keep closer to the stock, um, the stock steering setup, the stock steering angles, all of those things. And it will give you a much better steering experience. It'll give you a much better ride experience. All of this translates back into the suspension quality as well. Um, it is a big thing that is, that is kind of hard to understand. And a lot of people just don't think anything of it. Uh, but I highly recommend just to summarize, if you can fit a six plus one wheel, which I believe you can, uh, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm actually running system three ST4 wheels uh see here on my machine and if you see the the edge of the uh, the edge of the hub there is very close to the outer ring now what that does is again better steering better ride all that kind of fun stuff but a six plus one and five plus two some companies deal in millimeters so whatever retailer you're going to go through to order your wheels just ask them hey can i get this in a six plus one now six plus one really scoots it in there and if you're running a 10 inch wide tire like a lot of these upgraded tires are um, you'll need to determine if it can fit or not i know for a fact this is a broad statement 
A five plus two wheel typically will work in all applications with all tires. Um, now, that being said, I'm talking about the Razor platforms and, and the K&N platforms. Not for sure about the generals and the more utility style vehicles uh, versus the performance side by sides. Uh, five plus two is a great wheel. Six plus one is better. And the worst being four plus three. There's a lot of four plus threes out there. Everybody be very mindful of that. So that being said, um, there's my recommendation on uh, wheel offset. Uh, it's a makes a much larger difference than you would ever imagine. If you have a car right now with four three and you make an adjustment into wheels, please go to a five two six one. Give me a ring. Let me know how much better it is because I'm positive that you'll enjoy it. Okay, there's my spill on wheels. I spent a little bit of extra time on there because I think it's very valuable. And there's a lot of confusing information about what exactly wheel offset is. Okay, tires. Tires I've run. Uh, Maxxis Rockzilla, Pro Armor Crawlers, Big Horns, Super Grip ATV K9s. Uh, I've run Rock Tains. I've run uh, the Chick Tains. I've run uh, Tusk Terabytes. I've run the Big Horn 2.0s. I've run just about everything you can think of. And let me tell you, um, again, uh, I hope I hope Super Grip's not diving too deep into this because I'm going to give you my honest opinion here. Uh, tires that are excellent, the Big Horn, the Maxxis uh, uh, Rockzilla is an excellent tire. The um, Pro Armor Crawler and the Super Grip ATV K9 tire. Okay, those are my top four for sure. My my number four tire in that list, uh, man. This is what happens when you got too much going on. I can't remember what one of the tires was. Uh, let's talk about the big horns because we're going off this platform of I got a new machine, I got a stock machine. The big horns are an absolutely excellent tire. Most guys who run the race system or run in any of the races, they actually run big horns. A lot of guys do. Um, they do that because they're an excellent performing tire. Now, what's the knock against the big horn? Because obviously everyone chooses to get rid of them. They are a six ply tire. What that is, is, the, you know, in the sidewall, in the, in, the, in the actual tread itself, there's plies of rubber that create, or rubber, or steel, or belts, however you want to phrase it, whatever. Six ply, it's pretty weak. It, it is susceptible to flats. Um, however, personally, I ran uh, big horns on this vehicle, and then I went to Pro Armor Crawlers, and then I went back to big horns because I thought the performance was better from big horns, and they're so cheap. The real deal with these is those stock takeoffs here in Tennessee, I can get a pair of stock, a set of stock takeoffs almost new for about 400 bucks. Can't beat that. That's, I mean, that's new wheels and tires every couple of months for 400 bucks. So they ain't even, it's not even going to sweat my brow at it. Uh, it's a really great tire, really excellent performing tire. The con is the uh, sidewall. So you say that, you know, you, you, you see your buddy's rig, you want to make some upgrades. What are my tire recommendations? Uh, the Pro Armor Crawler and the Super Grip ATV K9 tire are, in my opinion, the two do-it-all tires. Pro Armor makes an XR version of the Pro Armor Crawler, and Pro Armor makes an XG version of the Crawler. The XR version, if you do road riding, is what I would highly recommend. Um, if you do, uh, you know, mostly terrain riding, I would recommend the XG. That's an excellent tire. I'm not. There's no hiding behind that. That's a great tire. That's my. That was my tire of choice before. I'm at the Super Grip ATV K9 tire. Now, things about the Pro Armor tires: slightly weaker sidewalls, slightly weaker sidewall. I've seen, I said it, uh, and I have seen them have very big issues in deep mud. If you get yourself in anything really, really soapy, wet, uh, the Pro Armors will have issues. Now, Super Grip ATV K9 Kevlar sidewall in the tire I'm running. It's a little bit heavier, but that comes with the extra strength. Now, the real thing about the Super Grip tire that makes it such just an absolute beast and, and is why it is the hottest tire on the market right now is the tread depth. It's got one inch tread depth blocks. Now, the reason I say it, and, and, and that is the pro for it, it has extremely strong sidewalls, extremely long where uh, there is not a terrain that I can think of where it does poorly. Um, now, it will do some damage. It will eat some drivetrains. It will eat your front diff. It will eat your transmission. So it is the best performing tire. I currently have the standard compound. Uh, it, I think it's the best performing tire I've ever owned. Um, I also uh, have a set of intermediates on the way sometime in the near future. I just haven't ordered them from Super Grip yet. Um, 
I would assume that that would be the highest performing tire on the market in, in, you know, end of story. Now I say that because the one inch tread depth, you really can't argue against. It's got the depth of a mud tire. It's got the tread blocks of a regular, you know, all purpose tire. And then the intermediate compound has the softness that is comparable to the Max's Rockzilla. Now, my suggestion on tires for tire choice would be the Super Grip ATV K9 tire. I've run the Rockzillas before. They're very, very soft, very soft. Um, I ran them for four rides, and I would say after four rides, they were at 65% tread depth, 65% um, life in the tire. And it has a six ply sidewall. Not interested in the sidewall issues. If I'm going on long distance, I can't afford to be running those you know, thinner sidewalls. Um, I also can't afford to be changing tires every six months. They're an excellent performing tire. They just don't have the life life expectancy of the Super Grip. So that's why I'm really happy for my style of riding. Super Grip ATV K9 tires, very, very, a very, very good choice. Okay, tire size. This is the most asked question. Can I fit 32s? Do What do I need to do to make 35s fit? What do I need to do to do all this and that? So you bought your stock machine. You've made a choice on tires. You've made a choice on wheels which in my opinion, the two, two, they're excellent things to upgrade. That's the first thing I would upgrade on all my machines after the cage and harnesses and things like that. But uh, that's what, what, what I chose to upgrade. Uh, I went to a 32-inch uh, a Pro Armor Crawler when I first got out of the gate. I needed clutch, clutch changes. I needed, you just need them. I mean, moving to a 32-inch tire on a stock XP turbo machine, you need clutch adjustment. Um, you can get through it. You can muster through it, but I highly recommend that you you at least do it for one vehicle so you know what it's like. I've had clutch adjustments on three of my vehicles, and I will not have a vehicle without it. Um, personally, the Dynajet kit was the best I've ever used. Um, I think there's a, the other comp two, two other two times I used a company called EPI Performance or EFI Performance. It's I'm not really sure. I don't remember to be honest with you. Um, but I had those clutch kits, and they're not adjustable on the swing arm. So I did a I did an episode with uh, TJ Krobe from Dynajet last week where we talked about um, you know clutching and all that kind of fun stuff and the the main reason that I like the Dynajet kit is it is fine tuned adjustable up to I think they said 50 RPM or you know I mean TJ was saying if your if your adjustments aren't within 250 of where they want you to be you need to get in there and make a readjustment uh, that being said. I pulled mine out of the box, put it on, got it adjusted to how they recommended. I'm right on par with their RPM adjustments. Um, I just need more seat time on it because I'm going to, I have the ability to go in there, break in and readjust tunes uh, or not readjust the tune, excuse me, but readjust the clutch set settings with the swing arm adjustment. It's really a great option and I highly recommend that. Um, that would be a B level adjustment. If I'm just getting a machine, and I'm going to go upgrade my stock wheels and tires, go run it. Go run the stock wheel, you know, go run your 32s. Uh, you can definitely get through trail riding. You can get through, you know, climbing hills on, on a regular clutching with 32s. Also, you can fit 32s on all 1,000 and above models right out of the gate. You don't need adjustments for anything. You might rip a fender. You might eat a little bit of plastic, but it doesn't matter. It's going to come off anyways. Uh, that's my thought on it. Both of the bottom connectors on my front fenders have been ripped off by 32s. The front fenders, obviously, still on the car. Just right there at the bottom, there's not a pin that connects it, so it's a little loose. But, you know, there's worse problems in life. Uh, that being said, though, let me get this picture off here. There we go. Um, that being said, you went with 30s or 32s. Um, 32s require, require clutch adjustment. A 34 or a 35 you definitely need clutch adjustment. I would recommend transmission gearing upgrades, uh, which, <laughs> thanks, Dustin. Uh, that is a custom window net from Dynojet. That is a one-off. So, you know, that, that, one's, that one's a pretty special one to me. I don't know if you can get one like that. Uh, 34 and 35, I would really start looking at transmission upgrades. Um, that's You're biting off big and you're biting off big time. you got to start looking at things like portals and things like that. So we're not going to get into that 34 and 35 discussion because this is just what do I need to get the ball rolling here? What I did was I actually upgraded my clutching system, but I chose a 30 inch tire because I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to replace wear parts more than I need to. 
Now, I've run 32s on every single car I've had before this one, and I replaced wheel bearings every other ride. I replaced ball joints about every four or five months. Uh, and it's pretty, I mean, it's detrimental to axles too. Everything feels the weight of your 32s, your belt, your, I mean, everything in the drivetrain will feel that weight. So I chose 30 inches and I chose to drive it better. That's kind of how I feel about it. Um, driving on a smaller size tire will make you a better driver. And then when you go to 32s, everything just becomes cheater size. I mean, you can climb things with 32s you never even imagined and you won't even hear the metal hit the ground. Uh, if you're interested in not hearing you know, the bottom scrape sometimes you're not hearing having that, you know, hang ups, things like that, not having to hit things a little bit harder, probably recommend a 32 inch tire. But if you're trying to work on your driving, you want to be a more finesse style driver, 30 inch tire is where I would go. And you can probably more than likely 65, 75% uh, belief in this get away with not having to do clutch adjustments at all. That's my piece on that. Um, all said and done. Uh, the big horns are an excellent tire. Run them until they run out. Run them until you get a flat. The stock wheels and tires, they work great. Run them until you get a broken wheel or flat or, you know, you're just dying to make that upgrade. You've heard my choice about uh, wheel offset, tires, tire size, things like that. Um, those are great upgrades. Now, uh, what happens when I upgrade my tires and wheels? What comes next? Well, it's another conversation about what's important to you. Um, personally, uh, my next upgrade would be a winch. I think that self-recovery is a really, really, really big thing. And if you go riding with the same group of guys every single time, or if you go riding with a group of people you're not that familiar with, asking them to pull you out of a hairy situation is not necessarily something you might want to do. And your friends might get sick of you and stop inviting you. Ask me how I know. So that being said, I highly recommend a winch. I run the Polaris 4500 uh, winch on mine. Warren makes an excellent winch. I've never, I don't have personal experience with the Super ATV winches, but uh, I've seen them work well. I've seen them last a very long time. Uh, so that's a very thing, very good choice as well. But a winch is a necessity in the event that you roll your machine over or you're in a place like Windrock. Saw a guy last week on Facebook where he was on Trail 16, got in a little bit of a tight spot, just felt like he needed a winch and uh, he didn't have one. So he actually posted on Facebook and, hey, can somebody come give me a pull? I'm just in a tight spot. Don't let that be you. Don't let it be you. Get a winch. They're four or five hundred bucks, and it's it's the best four or five hundred bucks it, 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 that it'll give you. Now, what comes with a winch, and some of the other gear that I'm going to talk about here in a second, is freedom. So I personally would not go to Winrock and go out exploring by myself. Um, but if you can self recover, you can now ride by yourself. I've been to Adventure Off Road Park. I've been to Woolies. I've been to a variety of different parks around Tennessee, Alabama, and Kentucky by myself because things happen. People can't go ride. Somebody cancels on you or you get so sick of people. You just need a day to yourself. I get it. I'm one of those people. So I've gone out. I've gone riding by myself before many a time. And it's nice to know that I would not ever find myself in a situation where I could not make it back to the trailer because I have a winch. If everything gave up, if I had no, you know, no, all four axles are broken. I know that I can at least winch myself back. <laughs> it may be a long day, but I can get back to the trailer. Um, some things that you need to have. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to finish talking about upgrades to the car. Um, the next thing that I would highly recommend is comfort. I'm a big seat guy. I have stock seats in there. I'm not a fan of those stock seats. They're very uncomfortable. Uh, PRP makes an excellent seat. However, that is a large purchase to bite off seats are like five or six hundred bucks um it's it's pretty big to me i would i might make that uh might, might make that suggestion after wheels and tires and things like that and safety equipment just because if you're going to get beat up all day doing what you love you may not you may not love it as much uh next time around so keep yourself comfortable keep yourself safe uh all that kind of fun stuff good seats are good but uh the next thing comes down to driving style because after you've upgraded wheels and tires and, and you've upgraded, you know, we'll, we'll talk about suspension too. Uh, a arms, lower a arms, you're going to bend them. The first ride you go out radius rods, radius rods are in the back. Um, and, and, uh, a arms are in the front. You're going to bend those every single time you go ride. And if you're, if you're not careful, uh, being very meticulously careful, or if you do desert or, you know, flat track style riding, you might not bend them and you can probably get away for a long time without it. But if you're in the southeast like me and you're near rocks or you're in Johnson Valley, 
those A arms are going to get trashed, and so are those radius rods. It's an excellent time to upgrade those. Um, if you're really tight on a budget, check the Facebook Marketplace or any of the sorts. Um, I actually carry three full sets of radius rods with me stock. Um, when I when I let me rephrase, when I had the stock radius rods on my car, I carried three full sets because I bought them. Uh, all the full set of radius rods were twenty five dollars on um, Facebook Marketplace. So I bought two and brought extras for my friends in the event that they bent theirs. Um, that's not ideal. Don't waste money if you don't have to. But eh, I knew I was going to upgrade them, and I just didn't feel like doing it at the moment. So 50 bucks later, I had two spare sets. Um, recommendations for radius rods. LNW Fab is really hard to beat. Uh, or ORB Fabrication is really hard to beat. Uh, they're very, very good machine. They're very, very good uh, machinist, and they make an excellent product. Uh, same thing for you know Super ATV. It, that is the cheaper option. Um, I run Super ATV box arms on the front of my car. I've run the two hundred fifty dollars Super ATV lowers that are just the standard like tube style. Um, I've run ORB. I've run fifteen hundred dollar sets. I have run cars with HCR suspension on the front, which is four thousand um, dollars. You know, for a full suspension set. It is one of those situations where you get what you pay for, but at the same time, if you go throw yourself some super ATV lowers on $245, you know, shipped, which is crazy cheap, you know, you're going to get, a, you're going to get a good product. And as long as you don't go out there and beat the crap out of them and run them right into a brick wall, they're probably going to last you a long time. Um, that's an excellent option. But as far as recommendations, that's kind of, you know, it's kind of how I feel about it. Um, okay, so we've talked about wheels and tires, and we've talked about uh, seats. We've talked about um, suspension. The next thing is Tender Springs. Now, All Things UTV is a sponsor of the show, and I love the product they have. I have it on this car right here. Whenever you get in your car, it rides like crap. I saw someone the other day, they posted, and they're like, pay $20,000 for this machine, and it beats the crap out of me. I said, welcome to the club. Go get you some Razor A Tender Springs. Uh, it's a very, very easy um, job putting those springs on. Um, basically, the top spring on a lot of the cars that come off the factory, they're just compressed. And they're regardless of what they're designed to do, whether it's to just keep pressure on the lower spring, um, I really recommend those. Um, that's just kind of how I feel about it. You know, it's kind of one of those things that it increased the ride quality. Uh, it's like buying seats, except it's a quarter of the price. It increased the ride quality of my car so much that I will, you know, that will be one of the first modifications I make on a car because it really makes you enjoy riding in the car more. Now, that is the bottom tier spectrum. That is as cheap as you can get in with a tender spring upgrade kit and you got a car that rides a million times better. I have been in talks with uh, Chris Windegat. I think that's your name, Chris, if you listen to this, don't kill me. Uh, that's Diddy's Bid, Diddy's big block shop. He's now doing some tuning on shocks and he can sell you some springs. G-Force Racing Technologies was recommended by Can-Am Factory for all East Coast drivers um, and Fox for West Coast guys if you're looking to get your uh, revalve and stuff like that. And then obviously a lot of people have heard of shock therapy. I've been in a, I was in a 900 XP that had the gold edition shock therapy set up and I'm not going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There is nothing comparable. It is a $3,000 upgrade. Nothing compares to having a $3,000 spring and valving adjustment done to your car. Absolutely not. If you want to have the best riding machine you've ever had, rides better than your truck, rides better than the Cadillac, rides better than everything, um, give one of those three companies a call and get a full setup. Now, Razor, uh, all things UTV has the tender spring upgrade, which is the lowest entry level, you know, enhancement you can make to your springs. I highly recommend it. If you're if you're looking to spend just a couple hundred bucks, it will fix a lot of the issues that you have issues with. Uh, Razor, uh, all things UTV also offers a Cloud Nine kit, which replaces uppers, lowers, and gives you crossover rings and makes it a full dual rate system. I don't have experience with that. I would assume that it's probably somewhere in between the, the just the tender spring upgrade and the shock therapy. But let me let me just cut let me just cut your cut you dry right here. I am, am am this close. It is like you guys, I have a wife who sometimes does not understand why I need to spend four thousand dollars on suspension upgrades for my car or for my razor. 
I don't know why she doesn't understand, but uh, if I had to make an, a series of enhancements to my car, it would be this. It would be safety equipment. It would be wheels and tires. And then it would be G-force technology or shock therapy springs and valving and all that. That is how much of a difference it makes. I, I just cannot articulate enough to you. It's like riding in a boat. If, you're, if your goal is to have the most comfortable trail riding car and you tell them that, shock therapy will send you back shocks that are the most comfortable riding UTV shocks ever. So will G-force technologies. Gary Hinkle is a madman. Now, all of that is outside of racing applications. They both do racing applications. If you're looking for that, they offer that as well. Now, there's kind of my list. Wheels and tire or safety equipment, wheels, tires, uh, and then and then some spring adjustments and some shock valving. After that, you can get into discussions about axles, differentials, and transmissions. For the UTV 101 purpose, I really recommend you go out, you get familiar with your machine, kind of learn the ropes and the basics and stuff like that. I have never, I've only, let me say this, in my razor buggy, I ran stock axles. I've only broken one axle ever, ever in my time of, of razoring. I've broken a differential and I've broken a transmission though. Um, to me, it's all about how you drive. If you're going up over an obstacle and you know you've got another big wall that you might not make or you've got a tire that's going to drop off into a hole that's going to be fully extended, don't stay in the gas. You know, that's the biggest thing is there's got to, something's got to break somewhere. So if you find yourself breaking stock axles, I highly recommend uh, the Rhino 2.0s. That's what are in this car. They're great axles. To me, they're somewhere in between, you know, um, they're somewhere in between me breaking an axle and me trashing my differential and having a thousand dollar bill. Um, RCV and turners are great. I ran turners in the race car that I had, uh, never had a peep out of them. And I, beat the crap out of that car. I mean, no, I mean, in high, all the way through the rocks, all the way through the hills, never lift the entire nine yards. Turner axles were awesome for me. I don't have experience with RCV. Uh, I'm actually in discussion with Ricky Berry to get Ricky on the show sometime soon. So maybe we can get some more information on the RCVs and I can get you guys a, uh, a more, you know, uh, accurate view of the RCV. Cause as of right now, I'm just not sure. Uh, but that being said, to summarize the pieces there, you have all my recommendations, wheels, tires, or safety equipment. Forget it every time. Safety equipment, fire extinguisher, number one. Uh, wheels, tires, maybe some comfort stuff, but most importantly, shock upgrades. You're going to bite the bullet. It's not going to make sense when you do it, but when you get your shocks and you get in the car and you ride on it, you'll never have a car without it. Highly recommend it. Okay. Next part of this, because uh, we're, we're almost about an hour, and I typically keep these about an hour and 15, but we'll keep going. Uh, things I need to bring, knowledge I need to have. Tire plugs. Number one thing, if you're going to keep those stock bighorns, don't, you know, go to Harbor Freight. Go get you some tire, you know, plug kit or just patches, or I really recommend plugs. I don't think patches work as well. Go get yourself 100 plugs. I've seen some Maxxis tires take 25 plugs before they held air. Go get your plugs. Learn how to use them. If you've got a if you've got a cheap tire that's sitting around, and you got a bald tire. Uh, practice on it. You know, make a hole in the sidewall, and and you know, if you have one with a hole in the sidewall, go practice. So that way, when you get on the trail, a flat tire is not going to end your day. Tire plugs are possibly one of the most incon you know easy things to transport, easy things to carry, but solve one of the most inconvenient problems on the trail. The next thing is a set of deep metric sockets. About everything on a razor is 15 millimeters uh, and about everything uh, on my machine is an 18. They went weird and they upgraded all the hardware for a couple of years. It's kind of strange. Um, 15 millimeter, got to have those. That'll get your uh, 19 millimeter will get your uh, wheels off. 15 millimeter will get all your suspension off and uh, get your everything else taken care of pretty much. The axle nut is the only other thing that's pretty weird. It's an inch and a quarter. Put one of those in there so you can change axles on the go. Um, things to carry. A spare axle is not always a bad thing to have around. Uh, I carry stock ones with me because I pulled them out of the machine. But East Lake sells um, axles that are really cheap. And also there is a part number. If you go to O'Reilly's, there is a car that actually has the same axles as the front of a 1000 XP, 
do some digging, do some searching. I think they're like 35 bucks an axle. If you're stranded, it's a great way to get off the trail just to throw in the back and have something that didn't cost you anything. It'll get you home. That's the number one thing. Next, fuel. Look at that. There's fuel back there. Don't ever, 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 ever carry fuel in the back of your bed like I'm showing you right there. The only reason it's back there is because I mowed the grass today and wanted the gas out of my way. So I set it up there. That gets hot. Plastic gets hot. Plastic melts. Carrying, you know, 10 gallons of extra fuel over your engine is a horrible idea. I would say 75% of the razors that I've seen catch on fire had fuel in the back just like that. There was a leak for some reason. Somehow it got sparked, caught on fire. Don't do it. Carrying fuel though, Rotapax makes an excellent, uh, excellent carrying cell or carrying jug. I've, I got a guy in my group who runs those. They're super expensive, but I guess if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. Carrying fuel. Otherwise, I don't have to carry fuel everywhere we ride. Uh, I can dip off into a gas station pretty, you know, I'm pretty aware of keeping my eye on a gas, gas gauge and knowing if I need to go get fuel or not. Very hesitant about carrying fuel on the car. It's probably a no for me. Zip ties. Zip ties are awesome. Have those. Um, something else to have is fuses. Your fuse box in your machine will have extra fuses. If you use the extra, just make sure to replace it. Common sense. Um, a valve stem may not be a world's worst thing to have in there. Um, just in case your valve stem goes bad. You never know. Highly recommend if you can make it work and you're doing some distance riding. Under that red towel right here is my spare tire. I built a spare tire, or I had, excuse me, I had Bat Cave Customs build me a spare tire, so uh, a spare tire carrier so that I could have one on the car at all times. Excellent. Um, other things that I will not go anywhere else without, uh, personally, I carry every single tool for the car. Uh, like I said, those sockets and a good impact, like a Milwaukee electric impact. Um, you can get away with zip ties, sockets, plugs, and that's pretty much what you need. Uh, an air compressor, mobile air compressor is nice. I have a little handheld one that I use. And um, I'm trying to think about all the things we have to fix. If you have a, a little halo jumper, they're excellent to have in case you need a jump on the side of the trail and you're by yourself. It's great. Uh, but on top of that, uh, jumper cable so your buddy can come save your life uh, if your machine's dead for some reason. Other than that, that's pretty much the gist. Um, I know that probably sounds like a lot, but I want to give it one more rundown. Things that I would carry, uh, metric sockets and something either handheld uh, with a, you know, if you're going to use a handheld socket, throw a breaker bar in there so you can make sure everything's extra tight. Um, Metric sockets, zip ties, tire plugs, a lot of tire plugs, just in case. And uh, a fire extinguisher. I mean, that's, you know, I don't, I don't like carrying fuel, but, you know, if you need to carry fuel, I would always recommend, you know, either fashioning some way to not have it directly sit over the, um, over the engine some other way. Uh, I know whenever I do need to carry fuel, uh, I have a cooler in the back of mine. I use a Yeti 110. It just dumps right in there. And I will normally strap the uh, the communist can that's up there. It's got some of those ridiculous um, measurements and how fuel doesn't come out or leak or anything like that. It's ridiculous. It's insane. California might be the worst. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, but um, I put the commie can on top of the Yeti, and it will keep gas in there pretty well, and it reduces the heat and all that kind of fun stuff because it's not sitting directly on the engine. Um, other than that, uh, you know, I don't recommend drinking and driving at certain parks like Windrock and things like that, but be responsible. Communications are great. Make sure your phone is charged. Carry a phone charger in there with you or even better, grab yourself one of these. One of these guys right here. Uh, this is a, a, a rugged, rugged radios, a little handheld. I use it during races uh, and it's got a little port here where you can plug in, um, your headphones. So I actually use Apple headphones, plug them in there and uh, I can talk through my speaker, but walkie talkies are always a great thing to have as well. Um, just so whoever's in the front doesn't leave the person in the back uh, too far behind in the event uh, that they have something happen. Um, anything like that, but upgrades, UTV 101, let's go through it all really quick. My recommendations for upgrades are safety equipment first. That includes a cage, a harness, um, fire extinguisher, Gosh, that fire extinguisher got, you just have to have a working fire extinguisher. Make sure it works. 
we had a fire extinguisher when one caught on fire and we pulled the pin, the pin broke inside of it. Get a fire extinguisher. Second, wheels and tires. If you're a successful driver and you're adequate on 29s and 30s, you're going to be shocked by what you can do on 32s and, and a nice upgraded, more aggressive tire with a nice side uh, uh, sidewall, like a Super Grip ATV K9 with an 8 ply sidewall, Kevlar sidewall too. It's super tough. I like them. I run them. Um, the next thing would be suspension upgrades or spring upgrades. I would recommend you do spring and valving changes first, just because you will literally not, I cannot articulate to you how much of a better ride it is when you make those adjustments. It rides like crap from the factory and those little knobs on your shocks adjust basically nothing. Um, Razor A tender spring upgrade is probably the low end to just get that tender spring back to working. Uh, next is the cloud nine kit from all things UTV. And then that goes all the way up to full internal valving and spring adjustments by G-Force Racing Technologies, as well as shock therapy. Both are excellent options. If you're East Coast, I recommend G-Force because they're East Coast. The turnaround time will be a little bit easier. Uh, excellent communication from them as well. If you're West Coast, shock therapy, the name speaks for itself. Um, and then after that, suspension components, upgrade your lower arms that are bent. Carry around some spare radius rods if you're really in the mood. Uh, get yourself some upgraded suspension. That'll help. Um, and then stuff to carry with you. We already went over that. So there's my gist of UTV 101. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that I would highly recommend. If you've got money to blow, if you've got it to blow, that Pro XB, y'all, it's a great car. That X3 is fast, but that Pro XB is very comfortable. Um, what we're going to do now is I'm actually going to go through uh, the Facebook all of the comments that I have on uh, our Facebook post here of people's recommendations for you guys um, on what exactly they would change on their car. So the first thing we're going to do. So the question I asked everybody was, what is something you wish you had known when you first bought your UTV? This has 135 comments on it. So I'm just going to do my best and see what we come up with. Uh, the first thing is that it's a gateway drug. Of course it is. Uh, the Arctic Wildcat was a leaky, underpowered piece of something. Uh, that it's the most expensive hobby in the world. Let's see if I can find some that's actually helpful. Um, Davis Young says that I should have bought a Razor and not wasted my time and money on a Ranger. Yeah, I'll definitely tell you guys, uh, utility vehicles are not performance side-by-side -side cars. Um, one of the reoccurring themes that I did see is, is uh, Brandon here actually mentions that he wishes he would have known that the Pro was coming out. Um, or he would have waited and bought the Pro, uh, which is a piggyback to another thing that people are constantly saying, buy the machine you want first. So if I know I have you know $10,000, but I really want uh, a Turbo, or I really want a Pro XP or a Turbo S, save your money, uh, get what you want the first time, because ultimately there was a very resounding answer of, I had to go back and eventually buy the machine that I wanted in the first place, and it wasn't exactly... Uh, you know, they spent more money in the long run having to go buy a second machine. So buy the machine you want the first time. <laughs> Someone just said, I wish I had known better. Uh, one is that you can't keep wheel bearings in a razor. I mentioned earlier that I was changing wheel bearings all the time in my vehicle. Uh, that came from, you know, hard riding, hard abuse in the rock bouncer and also running bigger tires. Um, I personally think that Polaris needs to get their crap together they have wheel bearings that are two different styles. If you look at them in the circle, there's a black ring that goes around, a black O-ring that keeps all the grease and all the bearings in line. I've gone to my local dealer and I've gotten one without the silver lining in it and with the silver lining in it. Um, always make sure you try and get the one with the silver lining in it. I don't know why dealers even have the one without or why they still make them, but I highly recommend OEM wheel bearings. Uh, just Everything else seems to suck. I haven't found one. Uh, someone said that they're just total junk. Uh, that's pretty funny. Um, one gentleman here says, um, bigger is always better. So I'm a big proponent of if I had to do it again, I wouldn't buy a two-seater. I would buy a four-seater. My family can go. They ride way better out of the box. And also, you can bring your friends and have the party wagon. Um, a lot of people say that they just wish their razor would start stop falling apart. Oh gosh, man. I got one guy on here and he says, one thing I wish I had known was how much money I'd be spending to keep the junk together. About a hundred grand. 
since 2012. Dude, that's ridiculous. I don't know what y'all are doing. I'm not even anywhere near that. Uh, man, don't buy a used one. Well, used, we had a discussion about that. Use, use your gut. Um, <laughs> that my wife is going to want one of her own. My wife and my daughter actually wanted one of their own when I had a one seater. And um, I don't know, maybe I should have kept the one seater and bought them, uh, bought them a car. A lot of a lot of people were saying uh, that they wanted a four seater rather than a two seater. Uh, I will give some shout out to Abernathy's in Tennessee. They're a volume dealer of all Polaris machines and Can Am, and they have the best prices. I'm talking like thousands of dollars cheaper. A lot of people drive here um, to go get those machines. It's something worth looking into. Uh, a lot of people are saying they just wish they had a bigger bank account. That's uh, that's pretty funny actually. Um, da, 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 da. I'm going to jump to one more with 28 comments. We're going to sift through these. A lot of people saying that it's just an addiction. Um, a lot of people have said, said, you know, they wouldn't buy Polaris again, that they would buy Can-Am. And this sounds like they're people that went from Polaris to Can-Am. And again, I haven't made that switch myself, but I've heard a lot of people say when they went to Can-Am, it, it, it made things better, it made more sense, all that kind of fun stuff. So, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't been in a can am. Uh, I haven't owned one. So I don't know the hassles or no hassles. So all that being said, everybody, thank you for your comments. We had over 40,000 people uh, view that particular post when I checked it before we got started. Uh, I think I had somewhere in the ballpark of um, a little over 1,200 recommendations. So if you're interested, go to Racing on the Rocks on Facebook and you can find all the comments that people have said about what they would recommend for a first time UTV buying experience or you know some kind of advice they would give. Uh, make sure you guys are subscribed on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all the other places that you can listen to it. It really helps us out in terms of being found. Also, uh, I wanna give a big shout out to all of our sponsors. Thank you guys uh, for the show. But most importantly, uh, I got three people who hung in here the entire time. Thank you to those three. And uh, thank you to everyone who comes and joins me on the live feeds. I like it when I see your comments come through. It, it helps me uh, kind of talk through this a little bit more, and it also makes me feel a little better to know I'm not just in my garage talking to myself. So uh, thanks, everybody. The audio version will be going up shortly. I hope you guys have a great weekend. If you're on your way to Bikini Bottoms for the Southern Rock Racing Series or you're on your way to Pittsburgh, for, or I'm sorry, Philadelphia for the Renegade Racing Series, uh, good luck to everyone this weekend. Racing is back, baby. And with that, uh, I do want to tell you this before we go. Uh, racing is back. So I think next week, uh, I'm trying to get my weeks straight here before I commit to and say anything. Next week, we're going to have uh, Anthony Yant on, I believe. That is the goal. We're going to talk about the adjustments he's made to wishful thinking. He's done some really crazy stuff. He's actually made the weight balance 50-50 on a rear engine car. Very excited. He switched over to the Mickey Thompson tires, claims they're better than the Super Swampers. That's pretty interesting. Uh, the week after that, we're going to have Tyler Greaves on from Super ATV. We're going to come talk about that full 1000 XP transmission that they're being able to put in cars now and sell and ship straight to your door. I'm in on that. Probably going to buy one. My wife doesn't know it yet, but whatever. It'll work. Uh, and uh, I think after that, we've got a few talks with uh, Shock Therapy. We've got a few talks with RCV. And we've got a few talks with other manufacturers. If there's anyone that you would like to have on the show, please feel free, comment, let us know who you want on here. And also uh, feel free to DM us and, and give us any feedback you guys seem to have. Uh, it's always helpful and always uh, appreciated. I want to make the show the best that I can for you guys. And if there's anything that we could change or we could be doing better, I'd like to hear your suggestions. So everybody, thanks for joining me. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, I am excited. Racing is back. And uh, we'll have some guys from the Southern Rock Racing Series on here soon. We'll have guys from Southeast. Uh, some guys from Ultra 4 are in the works as well. So thanks for sticking around, everybody. I hope you guys all have a great evening. Bye-bye.